I'm Steve Bonner. I'm the CEO of Cancer Treatment Centers of America. There are a number of uh, what might be perceived as failures at our company that uh, we did translate into some real successes. And we began with um, sort of a midstream fresh look at who we are and what we do, working to be very clear about uh, what it is that's going to make us different. And once we got to that, we stepped back and we looked at a number of things that were underway in the organization that were consuming resources and asked ourselves, while these all seem like good ideas, are they really going to help us get to where we want to go? And in at least three major um, issues, uh, we found things that were not strategically aligned, good ideas, but we classified them as a failure at that point, and we moved them out of the organization and used those resources to focus on things that we thought gave us better chance for effective innovation. Some of the competencies that we need as organizations to really support and encourage cultures of innovation uh, do begin with um, a real appetite for failure. I think that we need to understand that true innovation has a relatively low batting average. And if you want some significant wins from innovation, you have to be willing to accept uh, some significant number of failures. Um, I think that the, <clears throat> the concept in our organization of scarcity is your friend um, also applies, that uh, we ought to be able to come with scarce resources, new ideas, and really push ourselves to be as creative as we can in trying to test these um, so they don't get um, even overwhelmed by a lot of resource, but they get a chance to really struggle and, and, and tug away at the core of the idea and what it's going to take to uh, make them succeed. I think the, the issue about uh, visibility of innovation, uh, where uh, we're all working like crazy on kind of the core business, but around the edges has to be all this innovation. New businesses have to be susceptible of innovation. And we need to work to help everybody see the innovation that's in the pipeline and watch it go through the process. And then at the other end of it, you get to celebrate your successes and also celebrate your failures. I think that both uh, big change, big innovations, and small incremental innovations have to have a home in a truly innovative culture. And I happen to live in the world of healthcare, and there are some sea changes that are coming at us, and we need to be pushing ourselves at a very strategic level and making investments that we'll be able to patch together into a much different um, approach to doing what we do. Uh, but then, in our case with cancer treatment, um, every day for every patient, it's a different experience. They are a little bit different, the cancer is a little bit different, and we need them working with some very innovative people who can continue to adjust and react to that. And then, all the way back across that spectrum, uh, there are instances of uh, medium-sized and less, less small innovations. Um, again, they all need a place to come, uh, to be understood, to be vetted, uh, to be put in a strategic context. And, you know, is this really going to make sense with either where we are, well, not where we are, but where we're going short term or where we're going long term? Um, is it really disruptive and going to cause us to rethink our fundamentals, which can also be positive? Um, I, I think it's, it's hard to put uh, limits on innovation based upon size and complexity. Uh, the main limit that we put on it is strategic relevance. And we have tried to build a toolkit that all of our people can use to do at least a first pass with an idea to determine whether or not it's strategically relevant. When I think about what um, tools might be developed at Wharton to help us in the business world um, innovate more intelligently. Um, and I have to say, I don't know Wharton inside out. My main window on it has been Paul Schumacher. But 
uh, working with him, I think that uh, many of the, of the tools that he's building um, are very relevant and applicable to what we're trying to do from an innovation point of view. And the current work that we're together here for today, which is um, understanding the power of failure in innovation, um, takes something that <clears throat> we kind of know intuitively when we think about it and pulls it forward and gives us specific tools and processes we can work with to try to make sure that we're not just relying on that intuitive capability to understand it. And I think the uh, things he've, he's done with peripheral vision um, are very important. Um, in our strategic thinking process, we think about an array of futures, excuse me, <clears throat> we think about an array of futures and trying to understand where we're going. And um, we think about that peripheral vision in terms of not just what do we know about the natural process of where we're going, but um, what other companies and what other industries have had maybe similar experiences and have either succeeded better than we have or failed because of being where we were. Um, we talk about the future behind, trying to understand where we've been. Um, we think about um, the future beside, where we look at um, technologies that are under development that aren't our technologies, but they might be relevant to us. That issue of not getting so caught up in the milieu of working hard to do what you're doing today, uh, but having the ability to uh, take a broad look around you to look for relevant uh, parallel kinds of development activities and try to learn from what other people have learned rather than relying just on your own are some of the things that I've found valuable in my relationship with Wharton. Framing in innovation and, and empowering innovation <clears throat> in a setting where we're dealing with cancer mm -hmm. um, is really easy. Okay. And it's easy because of the disease we're working with, because cancer is a very dynamic disease. Um, it's very different in each patient every day. Um, there's a cellular reaction that we're creating with the treatment that we're delivering and every patient is genetically a little bit different from every other patient. And so uh, we have the, um, the blessing and the curse of having this disease basically say to us every day, don't get complacent, you know, don't rely on proven technologies uh, because there really aren't that many. Um, so our people are, I think, naturally uh, creative and innovative. Um, the issue for us is more how do we make sure we liberate that um, that we empower it, uh, that we empower it in a way that's likely to be aligned with who we are and what we do, and also to try to make sure that it's replicable, that we don't just find a, a one-off that we put a lot of resources into and then it turns out not to be usable elsewhere. 